Welcome to the Crack On Podcast, hosted by me, John Saunders. Crack On! Hey guys, welcome to episode 10 of the Crack On Podcast. And this week, I've been absolutely spoilt, really, by Gareth I. Jones. He's the founder of Town Square Spaces. He's a member of the management board in Cluster. And he's just an all-round top guy with some amazing views on the world and business alike. So it gives me great privilege and pleasure to introduce Gareth. Uh, This was recorded pre-lockdown two and also just before Christmas. So there are some notes of Christmas within there that, um, yeah, just explains where it is. None of it is edited. It's free flow. So as things go through, there are going to be times when you you know, hear a baby cry or, you know, the, the, the sound drops out a bit, but that's how I want it. I want it to be as natural as it can be. So anyway, sit back, enjoy and crack on. Good morning, Gar. How you doing, mate? Yeah, morning. Very good. You? Yeah, very well. Thanks, mate. Very well. Thanks for, for joining me this uh, bright and breezy uh, Christmas Christmas morning. I, you can probably hear my uh, baby boys singing Christmas carols in the background. Yeah, just yeah, to yeah, exactly. add to the festivities. I can see, I can, you know, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that in a bit, actually, because my kids went this morning, went to school this morning in a total different way. They uh, they can't wait till Friday, and they can't wait till finish school. They were one of the news articles today was about the um, was them drug closing early, two days early, so they were really excited by that. But then I had to break the news on the way to school. That actually, that isn't happening. So. Uh, yeah, they were they were a bit dismayed, but yeah, how's things for you, mate? How's things? Yeah, you know, it's been a pretty pretty incredible year. Um, the world shifted, and and I think for us in our business, what we've seen is now people totally get why what we do fits into the future way we all want to live, right? So yeah. yeah, it's been it's been difficult in many ways, but actually we see this as being a real turning point. So yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go into your thing. Is I'd like to go back to your childhood, etc. In a minute, but just run through for the audience what what exactly your business is at the moment, what it is, and what you do within it. Yeah, so Town Square, we we're a B Corp. Uh, we've been going for just over three years, and we we set up after having uh, exited from another business, which was around creating a community workspace. And what we mean by that is it's kind of like co-working. It's like uh, maybe shared workspace, things like this. But it's really about how you build communities generally in market towns which are focused on how you kind of really ignite this spirit of entrepreneurship it's not just people starting growing businesses but it's this nature or this this kind of streak of entrepreneurship that people can carry with them into jobs or into their personal life or into kind of civic action so yeah that's what we do we, we do that um across the uk now uh we've got spaces in north wales in uh west sussex and northern devon in Cheshire, um, in Oxfordshire, and it's yeah, it's um, uh, it's really cool. We're seeing some amazing people in all these communities, and I think that's what we've seen this year is that people realise they want to work a bit closer to home, they want to spend more time with like-minded people, and so yeah, it's uh, it's been it's been an incredible year. Yeah, what part of just we're in West Sussex? Is it open now? The West Sussex side? Yeah, Bognor Regis. Yeah, Bognor, Bognor Regis. Regis. So yeah, um, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, it's in a beautiful space. Yeah, 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 I love Bognor. It's a bit further. I, I, I live east, so I'm on the east side, you know? So I'm <laughs> the other side of Brighton, whereas actually Bognor is sort of the other side. So, oh, cracky. Um, yeah, great, mate. I'm glad it's going well. So do you want to, just for the audience to give us a rounded overview, give us a bit of where Gareth has come from, give us a bit of where's he from, how it all started, school, university, and give us a bit of overview. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm from North Wales originally, grew up in a small town, that kind of old story. Um, yeah. Grew up in a family where, you know, no one went to university, that was not the normal thing to do. Uh, and so in turn, didn't see that as being my, my kind of future. Um, always did okay at school, but I was never really inspired or motivated by it. It was kind of, yeah. I don't know, I maybe found it easy or whatever, and um, didn't have any direction in my life whatsoever, in the slightest. Yeah. Um, so... Did a bit of this, bit of that, tried a lot of things. Um, I have a kind of running joke with my partner here that, uh, you know, my, I've got about 50 first jobs where I've just tried everything a thousand times um, just to see what I'm into and what I like. Yeah. Uh, I did a fashion course in college once. I've, I've uh, worked in restaurants. I've been a DJ. I've, you know, all this kind of fun stuff. And um, yeah. it was really for me I about, I guess, trying to find where I... 
Yeah. <laughs> no one else could. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, it's, so it was... Yeah, I loved it. Look, it, I did it for my own entertainment more than anyone else's. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I think um, that's what, whenever I DJ is for my own entertainment, as the customers tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so so um, eventually decided after a couple of years of my mates being away at uni, I'd, I'd start going to uni and did a course in building maintenance management, thinking that'll get me a good job at the end of it. After two years, I, I left uni to get a job, and that job was in Manchester, working as property surveyor, national um, manager for a big company. Uh, seemed like a great opportunity, all that stuff, great pay. But yeah. you know, and I'm sure John, you've had this and the listeners as well. I just had those days where you're in the office and you can see that people are just like zombies, right? They, yeah. they don't want to be there. They don't care about what they do. There's no passion. And I thought, you know, there's got to be more to life than this. Yeah. So um, that's when life took me to Cardiff, which is where we met. Uh, and I, I decided, no, do you know what? It's me, I'm the problem. So I'm going to go back to uni. I'm going to finish my studies, going to get it right. Uh, I dropped out again, um, and that was yeah, 2000, uh, 2008, um, double dropout, worst time you know to ever be a double dropout, and that's, I guess, when I found the world of entrepreneurship, and so connected with a bunch of folks, had some ideas that we were kicking about, and met really interesting people, and what I realized was that being with entrepreneurial people, that really gets me going, right? Like yeah. That inspires me like nothing else. And so that's where the idea came from for ICE, which, you know, is grown to over 600 people in Kefili, um, yeah. uh, which was really just, yeah, how do I spend more time with people like this that inspire me and get me going? And, and yeah, that's, as I say, the rest is history. That's what we do now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's interesting you said about the dropout scenario, because there's so many people that have, that have got to that point where, you know, like university now is a total different animal than when me and you went to uni. And, you know, like, you know, they're now doing it all online and I know COVID has sort of affected that. But, you know, there's so many, you know, dropouts like particularly yourself or people that, and, and me really to a point, that haven't really felt like as though education was was their thing, but have gone on to do such magical things. Do you think that had quite a big impact on you going into where you are now? Do you know, it, it, it's hard, right? Because, I, you, you know, pretty similar. I get invited to a lot of talks at universities and things. And I, and I always, I downplay that part because I don't want people thinking yeah. that the dropout is the step. Um, and I don't think it is. I think going to university is an incredibly important part for anyone, yeah. you know, in becoming an adult, becoming independent, all of that stuff. Most, you know, compared to school friends, it's uni friends that I stay in touch with most frequently, all of that stuff. Right. So yeah. I think there is something there about the university experience. Would I love to see that evolve a bit so that the idea is not that you go for university, but you go for some other kind of learning? Sure. Yeah. Do we live in a society where that would ever be recognized in a, in a way which would help you to get on? No. You know, um, I'm, I'm from a working class family. You know, it wasn't just like my mum and dad could just get me a job at any old who when my life went off the rails. You know, we had to we, we didn't have that safety net, you know, yeah. um, and, and, and so 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 I think there's a there's a structure in society where there's you feel the need to get you know to get a degree in order to be recognized when you're in the midst but we just had a you know one of our entry level jobs in one of our sites go live we had over 150 people apply and yeah. and you know having a degree on there didn't make a difference at that point whether no. you've got a degree on your cv or not didn't make a difference it was about what you did with your with your free time what you did with your passions that's the stuff that really resonated with us yeah. um so I, I don't, it's hard because I, I don't, like, I don't think a degree is a worthless piece of paper, but I think sometimes people are sold a, a dream that that is what will get you to the next step. And that's not always so straightforward, you know? Yeah. I, no, that no, line from, um, I, I, totally, um, I, totally agree with you. I think the, the, the part that I look back, um, I, I, I luckily got a graduate uh, placement with, with what I did. I ended up going into, into leisure, I went to Bass and, I ended up going on a graduate and you look back and you know and I, oh, I, I've said this quite a few times in the podcast that Steve Jobs talks about joining the dots looking backwards you can't join them looking forwards and when you look back and think well it was part of the journey one of my friends did exactly the same thing he dropped out year two but he went to university tried the he got himself into debt and and and, and actually he had to wash his own clothes and do his own you know and it's a life it's a life journey isn't it and ultimately I remember going back as well the sixth form and you know, they were saying that uh, a gold award brought, um, Duke of Edinburgh was worth an A-level. Well, actually, I, 100, I agree with that. I think that because it shows aptitude, it show, it's in the outdoors. It's totally different to what an A-level is, but it shows the journey and you're willing to, to, to crack on and get on with it, isn't it? 
Yeah, and, and I think that's really the thing is how do you become a more rounded individual by having a, a much more diverse experience, right? The more yeah, things that you can get into, the more things that you can do to stretch your imagination, to give you a sense of who you are, I think that's much more valuable. It wasn't, you know, until I was in my mid-20s before the idea of going traveling on my own was, was anything I could entertain because it just wasn't something we were exposed to growing up, right? And, yeah, yeah. and there's, nothing, there's, no, there's nothing I miss more during this year than just turning up in a city you've never been to before with a bag over your shoulder, nothing else, uh, and a couple of days of nothing planned, just kind of mooching about and getting nice food and you know having a nice glass of beer or a glass of wine and 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 just feeling all those things you 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 don't even recognize every day that are new, right? And it's and I think that's the stuff that help you realize what's important to you. So yeah, I think I think with life, that's and that's what then I think inspired me in, in terms of what what I do with business. It was that learning about myself and what I cared about that that made the difference. Yeah, cool. In 2012, then, so obviously going back, uh, jumping back the, into the into where it all started, or you know, the, the ice, uh, Welsh ice. Talk us through, you know, the the ideas around it. How did you get those ideas? How did those? I know you said you were you were kicking things around with friends, and it just sort of not naturally happened. Talk talk a bit more detail. Tell the tell the audience a bit more about that. Yeah. So there were there were there were some key individuals at that time um, that that really made a difference for me. So there was a, a growing cocktail company called Rocktails that you might remember. I don't know. Yeah, they, yeah, they were on Dragon's yeah, Den. Yeah, Helen and Naomi. Yeah. yeah. So so they they'd been on Dragon's Den. They'd done all this kind of stuff and they were doing really well. But they were they were two really inspirational folks as well. Um, yeah. There was Ed Barnett. You might know Ed. Yeah. Uh, who then went on to to lead Ignite. Um, and so there were a bunch of these folks who. Um, I was kind of connecting with, speaking, speaking with, spending a lot of time with a guy called Nathan Phillips, who I, I think he's moved away now. And um, so, so that, but these were the people who, I, they, they, they just, they just, they, they saw the world in a different way, right? And I think yeah. it was whenever you speak to people about, you know, what you want to do with your life or ideas and things like this, generally it would come down to, yeah, but why don't you take the safe option, right? Um, and, and, and that's completely fine. Like if you're asking for advice on buying a house or buying a car, like that's the reasonable thing. Like you're not going to go and buy a, a Corvette every time you need a new car, right? Yeah. It, that, that's quite a reasonable thing to do. Yeah. But when it comes to like what you're going to spend the next five, 10 years of your life or 50 years of your life doing, I think it's a different rationale. And, 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 and I think that was what that was what I needed was just people who were like, well, actually, you know, they, they weren't closing doors, they were opening doors. So yeah. when you would talk to them about an idea, they, they weren't saying, yeah, but that's a bit risky. They were saying, you should speak to this person, this person, this person, and I'll make yeah. an introduction first thing tomorrow morning. And they did. And you go and have a coffee with them. And they'd say, oh, you should speak to this person, this person, this person. And it just snowballs, right? And, yeah. and it's that thing where the idea at the start almost isn't as important as what you learn from all these conversations. And so we had this networking group we called Welsh Sparks, where we met up in a, um, do you remember Fat Cat? There was a bar in Cardiff called yeah, Fat yeah, Cat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I remember it well. That was where oh, I, great first room. Yeah, that was, that's it. Yeah, so that's where I was DJing as well. And that's where I was working the bar in the oh, week. Brilliant. Um, and then going to these kind of entrepreneurship networking sessions in the evening. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, it, that was the kind of fuel. And so there's a thing in, in the kind of co-working industry where everyone who does it thinks they invented it because it's almost like there was just like this, zeitgeist all of a sudden where people didn't even realize they were having the same idea all over the world and so we thought we were creating something really new really unique and there are parts of it you know every, everyone does it differently but um you know then i met this global network of folks and, and we're still all in touch doing this this thing from a similar place and, and that really helped to I, I guess give some confidence so yeah it was it was really those people that was where it really started from it was a big operation to get started and you know um, still, still to this day, you know, there were, there were those days where we just, you go home and think this is never going to happen. Um, but you fight, right. You know, you, you, yeah. you crack on and you make it work. Yeah. And then, and, and take, so the concept, the concept of, of, um, Welsh I suppose about bringing that community, communal areas together or people that were working, like you just said, having in spaces, bringing those sparks together. Is that, is that what, in, in essence, that's what it is. Yeah, I think I think you know what I what I really struggled with was this idea, this kind of Silicon Valley myth of entrepreneurship, where you need to quit everything, ditch everything, yeah. you need to go at it, you know, full throttle. And and there's an element of that which is true, but for most people, you can't afford to do that, right? Most people have got yeah. responsibilities in life. They've got 
they've got mortgages, they've got kids to feed, they've got other stuff going on, you know? And so this idea, I think it's a really exclusive idea that everyone should just quit their job if they want to start a business. Yeah. And so I'm really more interested in this idea of working something up to the point where that's what I'm going to do. And then what you might realize is that actually I can do that with a different employer or I can do that, you know, uh, for as my own business or whatever that might be. And it's not, I say, it's not this idea that entrepreneurship is entrepreneurs are people. It's this idea that entrepreneurship is a thing that people do. Um, and so that's really what's been quite interesting. So a lot of what we did was that it was evening events. It was weekend events. It was trying to engage people who didn't see themselves as being, you know, frankly, most entrepreneurs, they've got the round glasses, they've got their MacBooks, they've probably got dark hair in their mid thirties, you know, it's that, and, and they're probably white, right. And they're probably men. And, it, yeah. and it's that, it's that thing of how do we crack that so that more people realize actually, because most face it, right. Most people we know hate their jobs. Yeah. And, and I, I can't look, I can't live with that. I can't live yeah. with this idea that people just think that you should hate your job. So, yeah. So it's, that's really what, what it kind of started from was this idea that how do you get people to care about what they do and do stuff they, they're really passionate about. Yeah, um, so going back to the entrepreneurs, it's, I mean, a lot of the guy people I've interviewed, and a lot of people I speak to, they, they don't like that word entrepreneur necessarily. It's a bit not like a swear word, but it's it's because it's over, it's a, it's used heavily now. Was there a moment? I am going to use it one more time. Here, so, if there was there a moment, any one particular moment, you thought, I tell you what, that's what I'm going to go and do. You know, was there any sort of day, any actual thing you remember that you just say, I tell you what, that is that is what I'm going to do, and that's how I'm going to do it. I, so, so I talk about imposter syndrome quite a lot when we, when we do our workshops and our sessions and things. I remember, yeah. I remember one board meeting specifically um, where I, I said to the board, like, I'm not an entrepreneur. Right. Um, and they said, yeah, that's, that's your imposter syndrome kicking in. And, and it, and it's like, I think similar to picking up on what you say there, most true entrepreneurs that I know would not call themselves entrepreneurs. Right. Whereas most people who put, entrepreneur in their kind of bio are probably not entrepreneurs right and it's yeah, that yeah. i think it's that thing about it's almost like um if you were saying someone was a success no one would ever call themselves a success yeah. right uh, you you never give that title to yourself it has to be given to you by someone else and yeah. i think the 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 culture or the spirit of entrepreneurship can be recognized but i don't think it's anyone's role to say i am an entrepreneur okay. um you can you know you can say i i am entrepreneurial or you know i behave in that way but that that's that's my view on it um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah I'm, I'm, just thinking now, I'm, just, I'm just writing it down, better change my LinkedIn profile, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got born, born entrepreneur is what I've got on this, so I better, I better well, change that's, that. But that's a different thing, that's I'm the joking. skill set, that's the skill yeah. set, that's the skill set, right? But this, yeah. is, this is the idea that um, it's more important to be an entrepreneur than it is to do the thing. I think that's yeah. the thing which is, which is the important distinction. Yeah, and just going back to your point regarding being, not enjoying your job, I mean, to be honest, the, the why in the setting of this podcast is it's got to be that, you know, people have got to feel like they can do something. If, um, you know, I suppose if someone was looking, you know, someone thought that, weren't enjoying their job, what sort of steps would you take as a, what would you take, what would you do about it? If it was you now back 10 years ago or now and you really didn't like your job, what would you do about it? delve into something I, I think i think it's i think it's finding finding something that you care deeply about that's yeah. that's the thing where it doesn't become a job then and once you've cared deeply about it you can find ways to make money from it yeah. whether it's starting doing consulting or chipping in or whether it's building a product or building a service the first most important part is to find something you're passionate about and i know that's a cliche like find your passion all of that stuff but it's it's not hard to, to do like a kind of, um, you know, a broad scan of all of the different, I mean, there's so many, there's so many, you know, I remember I was, I was fortunate enough to go to do lectures a couple of years ago and someone said, you know, um, there, there are so many problems around us. This is an amazing time to be alive because there is a role for smart, motivated, dedicated people to change the world left, right, and center. Yeah. And, and it's everyone, you know, if, if you're a, if you, if you love kind of barbecues and, um, you know, marinating meats and all of that you're not going to go into the kind of vegan movement and, and if you're you know and if you care about technology you're probably not going to go into you know another movement and it's finding the stuff that you don't have to care about everything but care about one thing so much that you want to be involved in it and I, and I think you know the TED talks are great for that um, social media is great for that uh, there are great kind of new sources like positive news and gadget and new scientists and stuff where you can see these kind of threads and think yeah I care quite a lot about that 
Um, so I think I think that's the starting point. And then it's realizing that, you know, what what I think over the, I think it's changing. What I think I saw quite a lot in the early days was people thinking, I need to start a startup. Yeah. And they're so committed to this idea of starting a business that they don't really think about whether they want to start a business, whether they want to deal with having 50, 100 staff and all of that stuff and all the aggro that goes with it. And then the fact that you're the one carrying the can yeah. on, the, on, the, on the bad days as well as the good days, right? So I think it's not always about saying I'm going to start a business, but it's about moving towards something. I think that's a really important part of it. Yeah, I look, I think that's great. I, I, I 100 percent sort of top and tail that that you know I think like, I, I found myself in quite a funny position because I've gone through quite a transition over the last uh, even 12, 20 years, really. You know, I've gone I'm, I've been in the leisure industry 20 odd years. And ultimately, at some point when you're in that game, whatever anyone who's sat there in the leisure industry will always say, I want to get out of it, right? And, that, and that's that it's not nature, but it, it's it's that you, you get to a certain age. I always say when I'm 40, I'm going to be not still on the front door of a venue. Um, but ultimately, I am still in the front door of a venue. But, you know, the other part that I always think about, I, I've seen this as a part-time job since I was young because I, I enjoy it that much. I don't see it as a full-time job. So why wouldn't you keep going on it, you know? Um, so it's, I agree with you, though, we're trying new things, though, 100%. If you're going to have a go, try different things because what's the worst that can happen? I think, and, and, and you know, this week's a particularly kind of important week for that. Airbnb, you know, went public this week and is worth more than, I think it's right, Four Seasons, Marriott yeah. Bonvoy, I think three of the leading chains it's bigger than. And I think it's the same thing in, in hospitality, leisure and tourism is that yeah. the, the industry is changing so rapidly. Um, the, 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 the increase in craft breweries, craft distilleries, you know, the, the, the industry is shifting massively and it will shift massively again in the next five to 10 years. And it's about being able to spot what is that thing, that culture shift that I think is an important thing that I'd like to be a part of, Yeah. which means exactly that. I mean, we, we, could, we could make a living off two groups of people, right? People wanting to get out of hospitality because they don't want to work late evenings anymore yeah. um, and they don't want to work weekends and teachers because teachers are sick of being uh, taken for granted. Yeah. So, so many talented teachers who are taken for granted. So we could make a living off those two groups alone. Um, uh, and it's tragic. Um, but, but people in hospitality have got incredible skill sets that I yeah. think they don't realize sometimes because like you said, you know, going back to the thing about qualifications, there is no qualification for hospitality in this country uh, in the same way that hospitality is valued in other countries, um, totally. you know, where, where people would be happy to be in hospitality until they're 60, 70. Um, we don't have that in our country and that's a tragic shame. Because yeah, there's so many important skills people develop. 100%. I mean, I've got a, funny enough, one of my friends, um, he's just left. He left out of his own accord, but I think, you know, anyway, that was his own thing. He left. Uh, but he posted on LinkedIn the other day back, quite an interesting one, that he was, he, was, he, he was surprised how little a recruitment officer knows the skills of a bar manager and, the, and, a, and, a, and a general manager of a venue and what they would do. And they, you know, you're in charge of HR, you're in charge, you know, there's so much, you're such a diverse role. And he was just saying that it was such, such an eye opener for them to even feel. And I totally agree with you with regards to the bartending. When I had Dead Canary, the biggest thing in 29 that I wanted to try and push was this is a, this is a job. This is something that, um, you know, these guys are so talented. They are so talented at what they do, but they don't get the recognition they, they, they deserve. And I totally agree with you that, you know, there is a market out there for anyone in that industry. I said to my boy, you know, he's turning 15 now. And he said, what are you going to do? I said, well, when you get 18, go into a bar because it'll teach you all the skills you need to know, man. Uh, but no, I totally agree with you on that, mate. I think, uh, you know, the skills in, a, in the hospitality game need to be, you know, need to be recognized, you know? Well, or that's the secret. That's the secret, right? I yeah. mean, with the, when I look back at that cohort of folks that I worked with in the bars, they're all over the world doing amazing things now, right? And, and I think when I look back to those skills I developed around being able to strike up a conversation with anyone, right? Yeah. If I'm at a networking event now, or if I'm meeting, a, you know, whether it's a potential investor or I've been sat opposite the prime minister, I've been sat opposite the queen, like all of this stuff, right? And, mm -hmm. and when you work in a bar, you learn these skills of how to spark up a conversation, right? And, and it, I think it's these things, product knowledge, you know, passion for service standards, all of this stuff, which is important for running a business. And I, and I think... That's um, that's the important thing. Is from your perspective, what do you see as being the next leap in the next ten years that you want to be a part of? You know, what what's the part of the smallest part of the world that most people won't care about, 
but that enough people will care about that you want to see as being the way for the future. That's yeah, that's the I, cool I, thing. I, I love that. I love that because when you when you're 18, you don't you you never look at that. Right? But I think you you said about times changing. I agree. I think people are looking at that more so now than they ever have. When I was 18, I didn't have a clue what I was going to do. I still sort of don't know what I'm going to end up doing. And but there is more. They are more in tune now. The youngsters are more in tune in looking at where they're going to be, um, which is really interesting how that shift has happened. I think there's a, there's a couple of factors at play. Social media now means that everyone needs to have their own brand, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. I don't know if that's necessarily a healthy thing. Um, I think people are a lot more in tune. I mentioned right back at the start about us being a B Corp, and that was a really important thing for us setting up Town Square. For anyone who's not familiar with B Corps, it's a it's a certification which is really about how you run your company, which is for the planet, for people, for communities, but also for profit. I think there's a really important distinction in there that um, I think people see social enterprise as being a bit soft and, and actually any good enterprise should be making the world better. Um, and in my opinion, this will be the only way. In the next 10 years, every company, uh, I saw the, 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 the incoming chair of the CBI committed to companies being purpose focused. That's a, that honestly, in 15 years, that is such a leap for the incoming CBI chair to say something like that. Um, and I think this will be the way for the next 10, 15 years. So, so I, think, I think there are things now which resonate a lot deeper. I think the climate crisis, climate emergency is something we like, none of us, we don't even get chills when we hear something like that anymore because it's just yeah. common language. But for young people coming through, like I feel guilty having brought a baby into the world because what's the world gonna look like for him in 20 years time? You know, yeah. he might not be able to go to New York or all these places. Uh, it'd be a miracle if he does. So it's, it's. Um, I think people, young people see that now um, and, and are in a position where they can build the skills over 10 years to get to that point. I think for people like you and I when, and, and people uh, in our kind of age range, you know, that idea of studying for 10 years to get into a new industry or a new career is, is seen as being too much of a sacrifice without realizing we've still got another 30 years of work after that, right? Yeah, so it's, yeah. I think it's this really hard thing about like the balance of how we choose to invest our time. And I think it's the opportunity cost of us thinking, investing 10 years into studying or, or learning something new is 10 years lost from earning or whatever, where, you know, I don't think that necessarily has to be the case. I think it's like staggered and stepped up to that point, but it's hard, yeah, right? No, and, like, and, life, and that's, life where, hard, that's, where, that's where social media expectation Everything has just shifted a gear into a point of, you know, people, unless it's satisfied there and then, they don't want to do it. And I think that that part is where I think we're going to struggle over the next 10, 20 years. But I was actually going to talk to you about the state of the world because I really love the, the B Corp and I really love the, the values within your business. Um, where do you think we are generally within, you know, there's lots of things, Richard Attenborough, He's obviously banging the drum. Do you think it is going on deaf ears? Do you think we're in a place, obviously we're in a place of control. We can, we're the only ones that can do something about this. But where do you think we are at the moment, generally? Yeah, so I think there's two problems to this. One problem is that it's really, really huge. Uh, and then one problem is it's our lives and our impact are really, really small. So, right? yeah. so, so it's like the plastic crisis where people are saying, don't use straws and don't use plastic bottles. And we as consumers think that, yeah, okay, we're doing our bit rather than saying, hang on a minute, Coca-Cola, stop using plastic bottles, right? Like yeah. it's a lot of these, a lot of these larger companies that are making the problem are making us as individuals feel like we're the problem and that that's never the case, right? So the climate crisis is, it, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very real thing. And, 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 and that's the first problem is a lot of people don't kind of realize that, uh, but, but it's, it, we can only do our own thing. And, and I think there's also another extent of, we cannot feel guilty for all of the world's sins, right? Like we're, we're just individuals and, and human beings kind of doing our bit. So it's really for us just about leading by example, because if we, we know we're, you know, we're, we're influencing a lot of new companies coming through. And so what we're saying to all of them is, this is the way to run a business. This is the only way now. Um, and if you're not doing it this way, no one's gonna buy from you in five or 10 years time. If people aren't clear that you're better for the world, people aren't gonna be buying from you. It's as simple as that. Um, and I think increasingly we're seeing that, which is why I think things like craft breweries, et cetera, are so popular because it's that sense of buying local, supporting local, that, that all kind of plugs into it. So um, I, think, I think we are seeing this kind of turnabout. I remember hearing a quote that, you know, the, the, best, the best way to drive innovation in the UK is to tell people it's going back to how it always was. Um, uh, and, and I think there's this idea that, yeah, you know, for us to, for us to build 
thriving communities and a thriving planet, we're going to have to change the way we do things. And that doesn't mean we lose out. In many ways, I think that means that we gain more. Uh, and I think that's a really powerful thing. I think for a lot of people with a climate crisis, the fear is I'm going to have to stop doing something or I'm going to lose something. Uh, and I don't see the I don't see that as being true. So some, some people will sit there now and probably thinking, well, how can you have, I, I, not necessarily just your company, but companies that have as part of their values or part of their the way they're running business, they've got green and they've got the world at heart, but actually profit is still part of that. How do they, do they conflict or how do they work in harmony? I, I think this is a really important point. I, I, and I think it's because we have this idea, I guess, that profit equals greed or whatever that might be. Um, the way I see it, you need profit in order to survive. And if your business goal is to deliver some kind of positive impact to the world, then the more money you make, the more you can invest into that. Yeah. And more importantly, the more security you have, which is your sanity, right? And so, so I think people have this idea that profit means I'm going to go off and, and buy a Caribbean island or whatever. That's not the truth. The truth is that profit means that I'll be able to create more jobs. I'll be able to say with security that we've got five, 10 years runway. Uh, and I'll be able to know that when we're investing into new areas, we're doing it for the right reasons. So the, the opposite of that is this idea that it's a not-for-profit. And I think that takes people's eye off the ball sometimes as well. You know, if, if, we don't have, if we don't have a commercially successful business, then we don't have demand and there's no point doing it. And, and there are too many people on Twitter who, you know, who tell people why the world should be the way it is and don't ever get off their asses and do anything about it, right? So I, like yeah. the way I see it, profit profit is evidence that you're doing the right thing, um, and profit is how you buy your own sanity for the future. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that, and I think it's such a really good way of doing it. The other way I would look at it is that you know there's so many people that are driving profit out there that don't even think about what the out what the problems are. So if there's a problem with my company that's trying to do it the right way, the ones that aren't doing it the right way. You know, ultimately, there's so many of them out there that need re-educating. And, and, and like you said, it is interesting now, though, how the, you know, people, the people power, the people uprising, I, I believe it's, a, it's an uprising and, and it will, like you say, over the next five years, I believe as well as you that if you aren't invested in the world, the world will not invest in you. And I, I, I firmly believe in that as well. I totally agree with you on that. I think it's a, and it's a really valuable point at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, how you know how do you if you're starting up a, a new not-for-profit Coke company, cola company, how are you going to compete with Coca-Cola? You just couldn't, yeah. right? It's impossible. No, this idea of profit, this idea of profit as being as you know, as the as the kind of um uh like we're seeing with Arcadia and all these big companies now, that idea of profit is dead. The idea of profit is about being competitive, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, I agree. So one thing we haven't really mentioned is the journey. Probably got to we've got to half an hour and we haven't even mentioned COVID. So Maybe I'll just uh, I'll mention it now. How's the actual lockdowns been for you personally and for, for business? How's it, how's it been for you? Uh, I mean, personally, it's been hell, right? Um, so, you know, we're, 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 um, yeah. uh, we're, we're, we've got family members who are shielding. And so we've really, I've not been to a pub. I've not done anything. Like, even though when things were relaxed, we didn't do any of this stuff. Um, yeah. uh, I, my, I mentioned about uh, you know, a young lad and, my parents have seen him twice, I think, since he was born. And that's, you know, really tragic wow. from our side. Um, yeah. And it's hard, right? Um, from a business perspective, actually the lockdowns led to increased demand. People don't find it easy being able to work from, a lot of people don't find it easy being able to work from home. Yeah. They don't have the, the luxury of having a back bedroom or, you know, a, a, a room they can convert. Um, you know, I've been on Zoom calls with people who you can see their nurseries in their background or, you, you know, the kids are running around and things and it's, Different people at different levels of, of privilege have different, you know, different experiences of this lockdown, and um, yeah. I, I think I think it's uh, it's really driving demand for our spaces and people wanting to be able to work close to home. Um, we did a, a campaign called Boot the Commute, which is still running, uh, which we saw that 85% of people, we from the first five million miles that we tracked, 85% of people want to work closer to home um, and 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 hate the commute. Uh, and I think it's this stuff which is it's really interesting and it's opening up conversations if, if we had everything in line we could open 20 spaces tomorrow honestly it's things Amazing. have really changed um maybe more than that and, and it's that i think this is the thing now where yeah it's um the double-edged sword right you know I, I, I certainly don't want to paint this as a positive but it's i think there will be a 
the best of times, worst of times kind of reflection yeah, in, in but, a couple of years but it, to come. But it's like, it's like anything that made, you know, you know, history's only going to tell us. I mean, anything you look back in history, things like this, this pandemic have happened, will happen and will continue to happen. And with that will come winners and they will always be losers. And unfortunately, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, we're feeling the brunt of it in the hospitality trade, but I'm a firm believer that, yeah, the strongest will survive and new things will come and, and take their place that, and that's what needs to happen. I mean, I, you know, to grow, we, we are, uh, you know, uh, as a human race, we want to grow and that's a, that's a natural instinct. And, you know, for me, I firmly believe that, like what you just said, you know, right time, right place, maybe, you know, and I'm hoping that by the sounds of it, that's what's more in demand now, but I'm hoping that companies can now see the benefit of where this, uh, what COVID has brought. There's got to be a load of benefits and that's surely got to be one of them that they want to see that lack, lack of, you know, commuting and that's obviously got to be better for the world, better for the person. There's got to be some value in that, isn't it? I think, and I think this is the thing, it's hard because I don't, I don't want to use a broad brush, but in hospitality, you're seeing the ones who've kind of rolled up their sleeves and said, you know, we're going to face this challenge on. Yeah. And they've gone into product innovation. They've gone into yeah. thinking of new ways to serve their customers. They've gone into, and, it, and it's not easy. I'm not, I'm not for a second saying that no, this no, is no, as no, simple no. as you're either up for the fight or you're not, but you can see the ones who are up for the fight will be more competitive when this is over. I, I'm, who knows how long it will go for, you know, touch wood now, yeah. this vaccine does it and everything's good. And um, people will be desperate to get out and, and eat everything they could possibly eat and stay in hotels, let, you know, all of the, this pent up demand yeah. is going to lead to a wave like nothing else of, of, of people wanting to get out and eat and meet friends. And, and if I was in hospitality, that's what I'd be focused on is batten down the hatches, make ourselves as efficient as possible now. And I know it's not easy. I'm not, I'm not yeah, in no, any no, way I totally criticizing. I, I, I totally agree. The one, the one it, I've really it's... loved, and I'd be open with this, is uh, I've really loved the approach of Brewdog. I don't know if you follow Brewdog or you see their journey. I mean, I love that James Watt. I think he is, he is awesome. If I could ever get a chance to speak to him, I would love to interview him because he, for me, like you said, up for the fight, all I've seen is fight. And I've, and I've loved his, I love their approach on, on the world, you know, zero, um, carbon zero by, I think it's 2023. You know, I just, I love that approach. I agree with you. There's certain ones that have really got up and got, and just innovated themselves through this. And it's really interesting to watch, actually. It's really interesting to watch. And I think, uh, you know, long may that continue. I think it's just, but Brewdog's an interesting company, right? Because Brewdog, they do a lot of good and they do a lot of bad. And, yeah. and, it's, and it's this important thing that you can't, I don't think anyone can be perfect. I think there's this big thing right now about being ultimately virtuous, which I don't yeah. think is possible. And there's yeah. a lot of stuff that Brewdog does because it's so bloody minded on its goal. Um, and I think that's something which is important that, you know, you cannot, I don't believe in heroes. I don't believe in any other stuff because I don't think anyone is perfect. I think everyone makes mistakes and, and that's the way of, of humanity. Um, and I think, yeah, it's looking at what are the parts of what Brewdog do? How could you apply that to uh, F&B? How could you apply that to retail? How could you apply that to airlines or all of these different industries that are looking at Brewdog makes people feel like they're really a part. I remember that story about how any brew dog member their job was to go to a bar and say why the hell are you not selling brew dog and that was their main sales pipeline they didn't hire any salespeople; they just got their members who were customers to go to bars and say why haven't you got brew dog why haven't you got and it on? worked right yeah, brilliant. and i love it. i love the fact that all the shareholders are there and I, I look there's a lot of ethos within there that i just think i've got to don my hat and, and respect because coming from a, a bar ownership, you know, if some amount of people buy shares in a certain town, they will build a brew dog in that. I just think, what a, what a great marketing ploy, you know, you get, you've got yourself a, a base of customers, you know there's popularity there because they've raised the funds. Just think, don your hat, well done, mate. I think that's amazing. Um, but yeah, no, I think there are a lot that, so where, where's town square spaces go from here? Where does it go? What, what's the next stage for it from your point of view? Where is it? So 2020 to beyond, where does it go? So I guess we, we see there being two main trends that will be the, the way now, right? Yeah. The first trend will be people, when we've been looking at new locations, our main kind of research has been coming from uh, estate agents. And they're telling us that in three months over the summer, they were doing 12 months worth of business in these places where, I mean, we've, you know, we've all got friends in London who've been living in house shares or bed yeah. sits and, and it's been a nightmare during lockdown right and so yeah we, we 
we, we're seeing a lot of people relocating to places where they can have better quality of life. And so that's a big part of where we focus on building our spaces. And then the second part is gonna, we, crisis creates entrepreneurship. It's the perfect kind of breeding ground for entrepreneurship. There will be people who are forced into it and there will be people who decide, you know what, this is the time. So when we do our startup sessions, our startup club and things like that, there's normally these four near death experiences that people have, which trigger them into saying, now is the time because they've wanted to do it for maybe a decade or 20 years or however long. Yeah. And it's like, right, no, now is the time I'm gonna do it. Um, and I think right now we're all living through a massive near death experience. So I, so I, think, I think these will be the two interesting uh, kind of strands that we're seeing. Um, and, what, and what we're doing around our membership is how do we make it more inclusive? So our new town square membership is, is really about that. And it's about how to ensure that every member makes so much more back than what they pay a membership every month that it becomes just a no brainer to be a town square member. Um, and the idea that, yeah, that they're supporting something bigger than just themselves. So yeah, that, it really is about that for us, launching our new spaces, building town square membership um, and helping more people to, to be, you know, whatever they want to be, whether that's create this entrepreneurship or, or start something new or just find this new calling in life. That's really what we're all about. Yeah, and I love, you know what, there's a couple of things you said. I love the community feel. I really think that is, you know, you bring something to any city that you go to or town you go to, you bring something of real value then because that, that community spirit, as we've seen, NHS knocking up, you know, when you've got to get to that point of doing it, the community comes together, you know? I didn't even know my neighbors before COVID. I know them all now, which is great for me because I'm from an environment back in Wales that I would know everyone on the street. They'd all know me. And, I, and I've loved that. And I think what you bring within that is amazing, mate. You know, there's a great sense of community with them. And I think it's brilliant. And, um, and I do really think, I mean, you know, people together make, make things happen. And like you said earlier on, you had one person make meetings and that's where on this next wave of a really exciting business, I think. I think there's a really exciting time the next few years with some, you know, I'm one of them to a point, maybe not immediately, but I definitely am going to get on the bandwagon because it's where I want to be. Um, it's how I want to get there. So, okay, I'm going to give you one last question just to finish off. It's been amazing. I've loved, I've loved tech catching up with you, mate. Um, if I was sat there and I was literally, you've answered it slightly as we've gone through, but I was sat there, I really wanted to, pardon the word, but crack on and get on with something. What one snippet of advice or who would you go and see? How would you go and do it? What's my next stage? I know we mentioned about getting another, you know, on being becoming an entrepreneur. What about it if I just want to get on now? What do I do? So my, my advice, I've, I've kind of upgraded slightly from my blank piece of paper. Um, uh, and, but my advice is get a blank piece of paper. Um, and and the, the, the best thing to do is to work out what do I do next, right? So you probably had this the same normally when when anyone who runs a business will have people come to them and say i've got an idea for a business kind of pick your brains and, and, they, and they tell you their idea and you go great yeah that sounds interesting and then they say what should i do next and and that's that's the thing right so my advice is work out what you should do next and the best way to do that is to dump down everything you know about the idea and then start asking the question of how do i get there and when you're saying how do i get there you're saying who do i need to speak to what do I need to ask them? What do I need to learn or what do I need to get in order to get closer to this being a reality? And the goal here isn't about a, like an idea of launching or the idea of the thing. It's just making progress. All you need to do is make progress. Um, and so my advice is get a blank piece of paper, dump down everything you know about this idea, why you want to do it, da da da. And then all of these questions that are stopping you from doing it, how do I get a license or how do I raise invest investment? I put that to the end of the queue because that's not the most important thing. You should yeah. be able to do it for free or as close to free in order to make it work. But yeah, um, that would be my, my main advice would be to say, um, start with a blank piece of paper, write down all the questions you can think of. Um, and then ask a mate, who do you know? Who, who should I speak to? Who, who will help me to get to this point? Um, yeah. That's the best thing. Make sure it's on you. Never put, never put it on someone else. Never put that outside. If it's an external thing, you won't do it. You'll never make it work. It has to be internal. I agree. I totally agree. And on that, I love, I love that. that. That snippet is amazing. If somebody wanted to reach out and they've loved what they've heard, really enjoy, you know, they want to ask questions. You come into my town, you come into my city, and you come into my country. How do they do that, guy? How do they get in touch with you, mate? Yeah, the best way is Twitter. Um, so at Town SQ, Town Square, uh, or at Gareth TSQ. 
um, or yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, Gareth I. Jones, um, and uh, our website is townsq.co.uk. So yeah, can't wait to hear from you. Yeah, loads of ways. I mean, we can't we can't end this without mentioning um, the, fa the the famous and the person that brought us together to a point is the supper clubs that we had in Cardiff. They were amazing. I love them. I miss them. When I come back, we'll get a supper club with Dylan. Um, I know he's uh, he's involved as well. And um, is he involved in in the operation? Yeah, he's our chair. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Amazing, amazing guy. What he does for Welsh uh, business and entrepreneurial side of everything in that uh, in in Wales is. Is amazing so i just wanted to be a big shout out to him he's going to be on you at some point i've just got to i've got to get him on for the next season so uh but mate thank you ever so much for your time i really appreciate it ever i am going to say merry christmas because we are in that time uh, but have a lovely christmas with the young family and thank you ever so much for your time thanks john cheers have a great one cheers mate and there's gareth i just really enjoyed his honesty i love you know me and gareth met obviously i mentioned it in the summer club and I just really, really appreciated every time I sat down with him and had a chat with him, it was just honest. And he spoke the truth. And I just love what he does. He's got the earth and the world in his mind when he's going forward. Um, and he's a, he's a futurist. He's one of those guys that looks forward rather than looking back. And I love that. I mean, I've just recently completed a, a course that really does make you look forward as opposed to look back. And I wish him all the luck in everything he does. He's a very good friend of mine. And as I said, if you want to reach out to him, he's, you know, at the end, he gave you his address and his details to get in touch. So anyway, episode 10 done. Uh, we've got another two left in the series. Again, Rian Manning's next. And then Jason Edwards to finish the series off. And then we're on the series two. So yeah, really looking forward to sharing everything with you. Anyway, have a great day, night. Crack on. Have a good one. Cheers, guys. Call. Oh.